I am the poetry contest coordinator and um, the also the BISFIS corresponding secretary and also a poet. So um, without further ado, I'd like to say welcome and we and basically we're going to start by having um, the winning poems read. And we'll be starting with the um, honorable mentions. And I, I will read the bio. I will be reading a bio. And then um, the poems will be read. And we'll go from honorable mention up to first place. So our first honorable mention is John Gray. And he is an Australian poet and US resident. He was recently published in Hawaii Public Review, Dalhousie Review, and QWERTY, with work upcoming in Blue Line, Willard and Maple, and Clade Song. Okay. So, Wendy, would you like to read John's poem? Uh, hi, I'm, uh, yes. Hi, I'm Wendy Van Camp. I'm here volunteering to read the winning poems. Um, none of this is my poetry, and I'm very happy to be here to uh, read for those who could not come to the uh, to the uh, broadcast. Uh, the first poem is going to be John Gray's. It's called Good Night. The moon's bones protrude through pale skin. Wind piles its bow across the tree branch violins. A wolf howls from everywhere but near. Pale light never seemed more itinerant, and stars appear like sinking river stones. A shape moves through a wilderness, more dreamlike than memory. It melts into your retina a moment before sleeping. Thank you. Okay, the next honorable mention is Megan M. Yu from Lawrenceville, Georgia. Megan M. Yu currently resides in Georgia with her husband, their child, and cat. She earned a BA in English writing and continues to ponder the meaning of the universe. Sometimes she even manages a poem. Okay, okay next again is Megan M. Yu. Her poem is called Valkyrie before rain. She was a plain Jane bird, silvery blue-billed crow, who croaked sang like a damp wind through a snapped pond reed. Her faithful audience was a half-dead contorted tree, internally deaf to all her ponderings. The day she took to wing, a gray rain soaked the tree ousting her to freedom, and she learned that the sky was better company. Thank you. Okay, next I would like to, Qu Quinn Brown is here. Hello. <laughs> and um, is the Special Young Writers Award winner. Quinn Brown is a 17-year-old author based in Adelaide, Australia. When he is not fretting about the state of the world or binging Netflix, he writes for young adults. His work is based on the genres of fantasy, horror, and remembrance. He has previously been published by Write for Fun, Stormy Island Publishing, Northeastern Writers, Inc., and Femzine. His poetry has also been featured at Draw Your Swords, the Feast Festival, the Fringe Festival, and local protests defending the rights of marginalized groups. So Quinn. Thank you. Hi everyone, I'm Quinn. I'm calling you from Adelaide right now. It's 4.35 in the morning and I'm very tired. Um, my poem that I'd love to read for you all is called uh, Lilith. She strides through fires with bare feet and silent eyes. Her taloned fingers slice through the darkness and claims it for her own. 
She finds what makes you human and whispers it to you with a voice like your favorite song, with a voice like a chilling battle cry until you climb the walls. Her smiles are sadistic. They send shivers up your spine. She treats pain like a precious artifact. She has the secrets of the universe wrapped around her body like tinsel. She has steel capped teeth that drip with prayer. Her serpent tongue tastes the air and her eyes flare wide. You have never seen anything more terrifying or more beautiful than this girl. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> okay, let's see. Now, I would like to introduce Adele Gardner, who our third place winner. Adele Gardner is the award-winning creator of over 400 published poems stories, illustrations, songs, and essays. She's a professional member of writing and art organizations that include SCBWI, CIFWA, HWA, SFPA, Sisters in Crime, and the Hampton Arts League. With master's degrees in English literature and library science, she's a professional editor and librarian, as well as literary executor for her father, Dr. Delbert R. Gardner. Okay, Adele. Light Voyager by Adele Gardner. Across the universe, I travel in the form of light, visiting your planet, pausing to touch the leaves and grasses, splashing to settle there a moment, tangling my particles and waves with those of the full moon, lighting this lover's glade, that poet's tea party, and the midnight TV screen of a lonely librarian petting her cats. Roaming her night yard, seeking foxes, she finds heart, her own moon and star. Thank you. Okay. Our second place winner is Preston Stone from Baltimore, Maryland. Preston holds an MFA from Sarah Lawrence College and was a 2005 Winter Fellow at the Fine Arts Work Center in Provincetown. In 2013, he was shortlisted for the Montreal International Poetry Prize, and he lives in Baltimore. Okay, Wendy. Hello, I'm going to read Preston Stone's poem, which is entitled deeps of time and innumerable stars. <clears throat> my father discovers the universe of my books and grows small again. He is 70 and nothing in his life has prepared him for these paperback beasts, armed with seraphs mean as paring knives, squalor of other worlds, vast armadas covering the void to land in these volumes of Heinlein. Butler, Tolkien, Le Guin. He picks up the similarian, heavy as a debt, spine soft as an old pair of boots, and begins to read. Lamps are lit in the forests of Arda, and my father, watching from a distant shore, a child among monsters, a mouse among owls, looks wildly about. Thank you. Okay, and now our first place winner, Liz Hufford from Phoenix, Arizona. As a, as a creative writing teacher, Liz Hufford felt compelled to explore multiple genres to better serve diverse student aspirations. As a result, she has published poetry, flash fiction, articles, creative nonfiction, essays, and short stories. Her work has appeared in venues from trade magazines to science fiction anthologies to literary journals. Speculative fiction and poetry intrigues her. In 2017, she was a finalist for the Roswell Award for Short Science Fiction. In 2019, she published a science fiction poem in 
Palu Texni and was nominated for a Pushcart Prize for her flash fiction. Curiosity is her prime directive. And Wendy, you will be reading Yes, I will be. I'm going to be reading for Liz, even though she's here. Um, this poem, of course, is by Liz Cupford. It's called Wake. Even water babies grow old with slime slicked hair and slug white skin. Wrinkled and puckered, they nap on bottom muck. Shrieks and splash startle them, stirring silt and sludge. They peer through murky water toward the light at thrashing color and firm flesh. Sometimes they reach. It's just a fish, swimmers say, at that unexpected touch. Most kick away, but want and grasp persist last. Shoreliners shake their heavy heads. He was such a strong swimmer. Thank you. Okay, and now um, I'd like to open it up for if uh, people would like to read poetry. Um, let's see if there are, if any of the attendees are, would like to read poetry at some point, I would say raise your hand or, okay. Denise, okay, there's one person, Denise Dumar. Hey. Hey. Hi. You're gonna have to unmute yourself. There you go. Hi, hi, Wendy. Hi, Adele. Um, hi. Hi. Uh, yeah, nice to see you. Um, she well, is she oh, can, you guys hear me? can you guys hear me? Yes. We hear you, but I don't see her. Uh, yeah, I don't see me either, but that's okay. Nobody needs to see me. <laughs> I don't I don't see a camera um uh well my camera let me see if my camera is off for some reason um wow maybe it is maybe the uh maybe the uh, panel needs to be switched to broadcast or that that other thing that uh seeing a our tech person needs to do yeah, my you? apologies but there is no camera option only vocal for attendees oh, no. oh sorry. i'm sorry Okay. I apologize. I didn't know that. Okay. Well, so I, I was going to say, I, I hope, uh, I hope Wendy will read one of her own poems as well. Uh, oh yes, I'd love um, everybody here to read. Okay, I'll uh, I'll read one of mine. Uh, this is called Folding Money, and uh, it was nominated for the Rising Award in 2012. Folding Money. We needed it before the rent was due, or the blood dogs would be sent to lap the difference between what we owed to our alien landlord and what we had already paid to stay out of earthly jails. Sell the light car, sell the liver pig, sell your corneas again, and let the bit backer boot you up after. Pay the rent and then on payday we'll have extra for the sin bars, and when my grav ship comes in I'll even spring for fresh sharp needles. Yeah, I know, you've heard it all before, but what the landlord doesn't know won't hurt his denticles a bit, and that big black beak of his don't scare me none, no matter how many of them arms of his suck out to grab me. No, not once I'm in the gel bed of the sin bar whistling Willie the Weeper while one tube takes the blood out and t'other sends in the clowns, if you know what I mean. And I know that you know what I mean. Ante up, pass, or fold, Baby needs new shoes for all 10 of his tentacles. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, and next I'd like to call on um, Henry Gibbons. Hi, thank you. Uh, this is actually, uh, this will be the first time I have shared um, this work or any of this work in, in public. I'm normally a scientist by day. Um, but the, the title of the poem is called Illuminations. And it, it was written after, um, after a while reading uh, The Name of the Rose, Umberto Eco's book. Um, <clears throat> I am reading a book about men who wrote books, hands bent and cramped, hunched over desks of wood in cold scriptoria, 
with pens of quill and inks of gall on pumiced skins. I'm reading a book about men who love books and the, works, and the words within, caressed with brushes of finest sable, jested with mice that nibble on mis mistaken letters, lavished with lead and gold and rarest lapis ground from Afghan earth, carried over silken roads and burnished to light the darkness. I'm reading a book about men who held books in labyrinthine abbeys, walled from the world, isolated by miles of ignorance, lit with candles against the darkness. I hold this book with a thousand other books in my hand, hard cased but unbound by strictures of geography, its text indistinguishable from the others, but for the sequence of faint pulses that travel hair-like roads of gold and heat-fused sand, lit by rare earth phosphors. I read this book through a glass in darkness. Thank you very much. Thank you, I appreciate it. I don't see any more hands at the moment. Um, Wendy, would you like to read something? Yeah, yeah, I would actually. Um, anyway, I'm going to read from my uh, Elgin nominated book, The Planets. It's a collection of sci-fi coup poems. Uh, for those that are not aware, um, sci-fi coup are science fiction themed haiku. Um, so they're very short. And I'm going to read maybe uh, a, a couple of them, just because they are so short. Um, yes, and oh, and just my uh, bio, I guess. I'm, I'm from California, and I've been a poet for, I don't know, maybe 10 years or so. Um, and my, uh, my website is nowastedink.com. Okay, here we go. The first poem I'm going to read is called Mercury. I circle the sun in spin orbit resonance, lonely messenger. The next one is called Venus Impact. Sulfuric air of Venus burns meteors of certain size. Small rocks need not apply. The next one is called Dysphoria. Life springs from the earth. Humans are as seeds on the wind, colonizing worlds. The next one I call Oceanus. We call our home Earth, part of our short-sighted hubris on a world of water. Uh, next one I'm gonna read is called Saturn's Rings. Rings spin their own path within the giant disk, mind the Cassini gap. And I think I'm going to end with a poem from Pluto. This one's called Planet Pluto. In the Coupier belt, dwarves mingle with comets. Size doesn't matter. And thank you very much. Thank you. Looks like we have a question here from John Blankman for the panelists. What are the main sources of inspiration for your poetry? Anyone like to go first? Um, there are so many sources of inspiration, but one that frequent, frequently recurs is my cats. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they seem to find their way into almost every poem or, or story I write somehow. Yeah. Anybody else? Um, I guess I could do. Um, I actually am a kind of a science buff and an astronomy buff. So a lot of my poems involve things like the space program or the, the, the scientific knowledge around the planets themselves, which is, I've been working on the planet book for a while, so that's why. But I mean, I even wrote a poem from uh, Star Wars. I, I watched an episode of the Clone Wars and it kind of sparked an idea about freedom and slavery and what, what might happen with clones. So I wrote a poem about that as well. Um, so poetry really comes from everything. I mean, it's, it's in the air we breathe, it's in what we read. And I think as a poet, it's more of a matter not where the information comes from, but how we use it and how we um, set ourselves up to, uh, 
to use the information around us. And I think that's the main difference because uh, ideas are everywhere. They're, they're in the wind. But the poet's talent is taking these ideas and turning them into something on the page. Yeah, that's so true. Yeah, I um I like taking ideas from, you know, my, my own life, my memories, things going on around me, politics, things like that. I love finding um beauty and romanticizing, you know, mundane things, everyday things. That's um what keeps me going some days, you know, living an unremarkable life. And then it's like, oh, the sun looks really pretty today. I'm gonna write a poem about that. Um yeah, I, I really love taking inspiration from the world around me, I think is is my biggest my biggest source of inspiration. Anybody else? I'll just I'll just say one quick thing as a poet. I mostly write a lot of you know science fiction, fantasy, and sci-fi too. In fact, we I used to help with a poetry workshop at Baldicon that, um, and one of the things we would do was science fiction and fantasy haiku. But uh, I'll just say that um, I think the the first poetry reading I ever read at. I was reading science fiction poetry at a reading where nobody else was reading science fiction and and it was just it didn't go over very well. I, I don't think they understood what I was reading, but it was but that happens. I, I get that I do so many public poetry readings <laughs> where it could be anything. Yeah. And sometimes I get the blankest looks when yeah. I read my stuff. But there are other, especially the young, the young ones, when they realize, oh, this is about Star Wars, their faces just light up. So, you know, it's, it's all a matter of audience. It's okay. It is. Yep. That was the only <laughs> time it was really bad, but didn't stop me from trying to read at other places like, well, Balticon and stuff. Well, anyway, would, um, would anybody else like to uh, read some more poetry? I could read one if you want. Sure. Um, this poem appeared in Fluff and Vine, which is um, the literary magazine of Pika Lake, where I spent my childhood. And the poem was inspired by experiences there. Witches We by Adele Gardner. The moon shone so brightly on the dark lake a ladder of moonlight stretched like pearls on black velvet, connecting us to heaven. Despite the cool evening, it didn't take much persuading. Let's go for a dip, I suggested. Just us two witches together, and my sister ran up into the boathouse to change and turn on a homing beacon so we could distinguish our shore from all the other night-clad cottages that merged into the impenetrable woods in the darkness. One, two, Three, we jumped in, transforming the painful shock of the cold lake into whoops of triumph. Yes, it feels icy now, but just wait until I try that new popsicle spell. Witches together, we bobbed in the night surf of Tuca Lake while small, beautiful bats darted overhead with tiny cheeps, and my sister's little gray tuxedo cat watched worriedly from the windows, waiting to see if we dissolved into the moonlight wa midnight waves and melted clean away. We had the whole lake for our cauldron with the moon already inside. We named the living ingredients, my friend, the large catfish who ruled the fish in these parts with a generous twitch of black mustaches. Our dad's chortle of glee as he emerged from his soaring swan dive every summer, now many summers past, the lake remembers. The small slaty stones on which I'd drawn messages every summer before skipping them out as far as they would go, carrying words like wishes. Not even my sister knew what those messages contained, only the lake knew and my fishy friends, reading curiously as the stones sank into the soppy mud of the lake's floor, stirring up a small green-brown explosion. Layers and layers of Tuca memories stitched across both our lives with this lake running deep as the heart through us both. We swam up the moon's ladder, two witches together, a secret meeting, talking of witchy things. 
our shared love of Ruth Chu, who awakened magic in us both with her children's books, The Wednesday Witch and What the Witch Left, stories to which I'd introduced my sister when she was only four, and I at nine, feeling so worldly wise, a grown-up witch who swam with her magical fish-finding rock every summer and stood, sought out secret magical clues in every Halloween party. My sister had taken it one step farther after we'd plumbed the secrets of mom's dresser drawers, seeking magical treasures like Ruth Chu's heroines. My sister struck up quite a correspondence with the author until at last the greatest witch we knew had written one last time to say she couldn't exchange any more letters due to a severe lack of time. She drew a picture of a witch crying, prompting my sister to write even more, generously donating her own time to replace the time Ruth had lost. As grown witches now, we knew enough to make our own magic. We found it everywhere, the marvel of a double rainbow, the loyal black cat who rode my shoulders and snuggled close to guard me by night with his predecessor's kind green eyes the miracle of loved ones visiting in dreams. In the beautiful solitude of Huca Lake at night, we sank into the lights reflecting from the farther shore like colored lanterns, blue, green, red, white, yellow, and the moon so high above as far as a castle wall, a celestial castle closing its gates in a massive wall of clouds, lined cobalt and silver gray like armor, while the moon shone through an open casement, illuminating the distant shore like the painting of a shipwreck come to life. That high drama, a lighting so striking none could believe except we who had seen it. The moon opening her vault of magic to us high up in the sky. We drank in her wisdom with the lake, ducking down big gulps of molten silver as soft as snow moonlight sprinkling a field of lilies in the black lake's reflected sky. When we got too tired to swim to shore after all our back floating, stargazing and magic working, our magical cat climbed onto the prow of our old rowboat, sitting beside the guiding lanterns while the boat magically rowed to find us, oars tended by the ghost men that we'd played baseball with all summer on the hill above dad's field at the entrance to the magical wooded kingdom beside our childhood home in Tuca Park. We hung on the handles at the stern, pulled behind the boat, gliding through black water soft as silk, invisible in the quiet wake, luxuriating like ghosts. Anyone looking on would only see one cat on the prow, one cat on the stern, perched like icons of bass while our chuckles rose invisibly from behind the boat, an unearthly humor like the voice of Lake Tuca herself. Thank you. Sorry, that was so long. <laughs> That's all right. Okay. <laughs> now we have um, Denise Dumars would like to say something. Hey, I, I have one more. One more poem I'll read. Um, most of poetry I write tends toward the dark side and I do write science fiction, fantasy and horror, but somehow even if it's funny, it always seems to go to the dark side. Uh, this is a poem I, I wrote uh, called Ghost Riders and it's dedicated to my, my late cousin, James Hicks, who is a biker. It's called Ghost Riders. They're not what you think. Transparent hell's angels, dude way of made 280 in life but now weighs less than a feather. A last member of the Hessians 1% is on his oxygen tank today, telling me how he saw his late friend, the one Jim Carroll wrote about, who came looking for him right there in intensive care, transparent as a hooker's raincoat. You don't tell him that you've seen them as they laugh through red light cameras, disappearing into the Milky Way out around Yucca Valley heading toward the honky-tonk at Pappy's Pioneer Town, leaving you in the dust of life, out where the sky is vaster than the afterlife, darker than the demons that compelled the ghost riders to leave the mainstream world behind, even when they were alive, none fearing the end that inevitably comes too soon. 
If you taste salt and reaper ale on your tongue, grow claustrophobic beneath a sky you had no idea was so crowded, and the hollow roar of phantom engines nearly drowns out the Graham Parsons tribute band at Pappy's, and you are the one sad mofo alone in the crowd. You could disappear into the tarantula darkness of the Mojave, a vision quest beneath the great chaotic smear of the night sky, or you could stop a while and listen to their voices before going back to the bar. Last call, just too damned ironic, then the long, dark, lonely road home. Don't worry, they'll be here when you travel the dark highway again. You'll start to feel the freedom of coming and going as one pleases without corporeal limits. It's a trap, don't believe it. Every one of them would come back full throttle, sell his weevily soul for just one more taste of Jack Daniels, one kiss from the girl singer in Daisy Dukes. So finish your beer, say a prayer, give them the middle finger salute or any other gesture you feel is appropriate, and then let them fade, fade, fade. Headlights lost in the Milky Way. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So, um, would anybody else like to read or just, you know, share some thoughts on, or to, you know, or talk about your current projects? Anything? Well, I could read another poem if that's all right with everyone. Sure. I mentioned my Star Wars poem, so maybe I'll hold on a sec. It's down here. Come on. Let's see. Excuse my uh, paper here. Oh, hopefully I have it. Oh, here it is. All right. Um, this was the one I mentioned before that I had read at just a general poetry reading. Mm -hmm. And uh, when, when the, uh, the young people realized it was about Star Wars, it, it's not blatantly, of course, but uh, that was the inspiration for it. And... Uh, so I thought I'd go ahead and read it for you. Um, it was originally published in a magazine called Lit Up back in September of 2018. And it's called, He Is Your Brother. I do not wear chains, but I am a slave. Born in factory, fathered by science, trained to be a fighter in human wars. I am declared the ultimate soldier. My sergeant says, look right and then to the left. Each face is an exact copy of my own. We are the same height, same build, the same soul. Treat him well, for he is your brother. As my brothers die around me, I wonder if this is all there is. I do my duty fighting in another war. We move in formation under the hot sun. Do I stand with my brothers and fight, or do I fight alone for our freedom? And I see it. very short. <laughs> Thank you. But uh, if you want, we could talk a little bit more about poetry inspiration or... I think that would be good. Would that be good? Yeah. I still have a little more time to fill here. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. Why don't you all talk about um, what your sources of inspiration and, and, and how you got started writing poetry? Oh, that's a good one, too. Um, I started writing poetry, um, I never really, I started off just writing, um, you know, short stories, novels, things like that, because um, my best friend writes poetry, and I always read their poetry and went, oh, I could never write anything as good as that, mm -hmm. um, so it was a very intimidating field for me to get into, and then I um, I attended a, a poetry workshop, spoken word poetry workshop at a local um, LGBT youth centre, and the two poets there, um, Wallace Prophet, actually a local Adelaide poet, um, they read this poem that they'd written and it was so powerful and I didn't realize poetry could do that up until that point um, and so I I went home and I actually it was like 10 o'clock at night and I sat and I ate pasta and I wrote the first poem I'd properly written um, in forever and then about two weeks later I got up and I performed it at um, Wallace's uh, spoken word event, Draw Your Swords, and that was really what kick-started everything, and I, I still go to Draw Your Swords as often as I can, 
Um, it's a wonderful community and that sort of community as well is also a huge source of inspiration for me, um, especially the LGBT community. That's, um, yeah, they're, they're amazing. <laughs> That's wonderful. Great. So what about, what about um, you, Adele, or Liz? What, are, what, what inspires you or do you have any specific styles of poetry that you were interested in? What draws you to them? What do you want to go first this time? Sure. Um, if there is a particular style, whether it's haiku or villanelle or uh, something else, I have to try it to see if I could do it. But of course, rhyming poetry is not uh, what people are currently looking for. So I tend to stay away from the sonnets, not to say there one doesn't occur now and then, but uh, there isn't a very big market. Well, my dad was also a creative writer and a professor of creative writing for a certain number of years. And um, I always aspired to, I mean, I loved reading and writing from a very young age. And he would read us his poems at the dinner table and we'd all be so excited when everyone would get published. So I kind of just naturally wanted to follow in his footsteps. And um, when I was a teenager, he really became my mentor and um, he would critique my work. He gave me tips on how to submit my work and he was introducing me to all these great writers from the past and I, you know I would share with him what I was reading and and uh, it was really cool to me because I was reading Roger Zlasny's Amber and Roger Zlasny he was such a clever guy and he would include all these literary allusions in there that I didn't realize were allusions but I just loved how they sounded so I would be reading them to my dad and he's like that's a quote from Charles Harold to the Dark Tower came and you know so that that was just <laughs> awesome to me and um, I, I also enjoy playing with form I love the freedom of free verse but to me, free verse is also a form. It's just a form that allows you greater freedom, but you, it's still a form. So I, you know, and, and Liz, like you, I found that it is difficult to find markets for some of the formal verse. And it takes a lot more time sometimes for me to, to work something up, but I still enjoy the challenge. So I, were, mm -hmm. I wrote a Sestina a little while ago. I haven't found a market for it, but it was a lot mm -hmm. of fun. Yeah, just like you, Adele, I, I really do love um, freeform poetry. It's the style that I wrote most in. Um, but as Liz mentioned, sonnets, I've also started recently experimenting with Shakespearean sonnets and kind of playing with that format and seeing what I can do. Um, but yeah, rhyming poetry, I mean, sometimes it's nice to have a bit of a challenge. Other times I get frustrated by the constraints of those kinds of formats and I just want to be able to write what I'm thinking rather than be concerned about meter and rhyme and things like that. Um, but yeah, I, I love sonnets as a style. I think they're really beautiful. Haikus as well. I've, I've recently started writing haikus. And again, the, the short style of it is something that I really love. Yeah. Yeah, I, I funny. It's, I've really, I write mostly the sci-fi coup. That's kind of my trademark. It was uh, the first poetry form I was taught um, when I got into poetry. I was like in my 40s or something. I, I, I kind of come from a strange background when it comes to poetry, even though when I was in high school and whatever, I, I had a little notebook and I wrote a few poems and never published them. Um, but then later when I became a, a television producer and director, I actually put together a TV show called Coffee House Poetry. And I invited local poets to come and read their poetry on television. Wow. And I would broadcast that. But I found the poets so difficult to work with. I mean, literally, they were the snottiest, horriblest people you'd ever want to be around. And I, I think because they didn't think I was part of the community, they saw me as the TV producer, uh, and I wasn't writing poetry of my own, they treated me as an outsider, and they made life very difficult for me. So I finally closed the TV show, and I, I remember telling my husband, I said, you know what, I am never ever in my life going to work with a poet again. <laughs> they are out of my life forever. And, you know, the funny thing is, um, uh, many years ago, I just happened to be at a local um, convention. It was called Condor. It's uh, a smaller um, sci-fi convention here in California. And I've been a regular in the art show for years. It's a jeweler. Well, I finished putting up my jewelry and I just came outside. I thought, oh, the ice cream socials in like two hours. 
what could I do to kind of um, kill the time? Well, I mean, I was sitting there, the sun was hot, it was beating down on me, and I just happened to turn to the side, and I saw a sign that said Sci-Fi Coup, starting in like five minutes. And I went, what the hell is that? And I went, you know what? It's cool inside and there's cold water. I'm going to just go in. So I went into the room and there were a bunch of people there. I went, oh, good. There's like six or seven people. It's Friday. That's a really good turnout for a Friday afternoon. And so I sat down, poured myself some water. And suddenly one of the people break away and she says, hi, I'm going to be your instructor today. I guess you're my only student. And I went, what? And she goes, oh, no, these are my friends. They're here to support me. They're all national poetry um, editors for magazines. I went, what? <laughs> but I, I felt so embarrassed because I guess I was her only student that I, I, I would have left otherwise, <laughs> to be honest. <laughs> but um, I stayed, and she gave the full presentation of how to write sci-fi coup poems. Now, mind you, I hadn't written a poem since high school. It had been like over 20 years since I had even attempted a poem. Poem. and but I, I did her course it seemed simple enough she went over the forms what a tego was and things like that and uh, and how to brainstorm a poem too which I found very interesting um and then at the end she says okay class I'd like you to all stand up and read your poem and I went what <laughs> I was so nervous but you know thankfully I, I do have some performing background so I stood up I read my little sci-fi coup poem and I sat down and she said, oh, that was very nice. And then she did a little critique. But as she was doing the critique, one of the magazine editors leaned over and said, boy, I really love your poem. I'd like to publish it in my magazine. I'll pay you. And I went, what? And ever since then, I've written sci-fi coup poems, and almost every one of them is published. So I mean, it's called serendipity. I have since branched out to do longer work. But um, I find I actually enjoy writing shorter poems, and I think the longer ones I struggle with more. But my, my brain is kind of wired to be more um, to the point. Even with my prose that I write and publish, um, I tend to do shorter sentences. I'm more of a, what do they call it, a Hemingway as opposed to a Faulkner when I write. So uh, Sci-Fi Coup has done well by me. And of course, since I also uh, do illustrations, I started illustrating the poems just on a whim and that took off too. And now I sell them at art shows. So, you know, it, 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 it's funny how this all happens, but I always laugh because I remember that day when I told my husband, I'm never going to work with a poet again. Mm -hmm. I'm a poet myself now. So. <laughs> <laughs> so can we hear from Denise? Oh, sure. Do you wish to speak to us, Denise? Um, <clears throat> Um, yeah, sure. The uh, thing with, with poetry is that I honestly don't know when I started writing it. Um, I know I was pretty young, probably maybe between 10 and 12. I've always wanted to be a writer. That's, that's my, my thing. And um, for me, poetry is very different from trying to write prose. I mean, I feel like you really need to get somehow into a different part of your brain to write poetry than you do if you, than in writing fiction or nonfiction. Um, it's really interesting that way. And um, I've never really been much for formalist verse. I, I don't really read that much of it. I don't write that much of it. Um, and I guess it's just because when I was growing up in the rebellious 60s and 70s, uh, it just wasn't cool to write uh, stuff that rhymed. <laughs> But uh, nevertheless, uh, for whatever reason, I prefer free verse. Although I do like some forms. I do like the haiku and, and other Japanese forms and the sci-fi ku and haraku are a lot of fun. Um, I think that, you know, with poetry, people are always wondering, well, am I doing it right? And it's poetry. There's, unless you say, I am writing a sonnet or I am writing a haiku, there's really no doing it right or doing it wrong. It's whatever works for you. And I think a lot of people start out writing and they don't know that. And it kind of stifles their creativity. But, you know, if I have any advice for beginning writers, it's always don't let people stifle your creativity. <laughs> Do your own thing, you know? So that's my opinion anyway. <laughs> Thank you. So we, we actually have um, an instant 
Haiku here from um, one of our attendees. Um, Bruce A, would you like to read it or would you like us to read it for you? Can you unmute Bruce A? Okay. I, robot, am not. You'll not find me law restrained. Your trust is needed. Thank you. Okay, let's see. Okay. Nice. Yeah, very good. So we have another question here. Would you advise any particular, oops, any particular favorite poet for people who do not like or understand poetry? Um, I mean, for me, I was just thinking about this when Wendy was speaking about her experiences with, you know, uh, pretentious poets. Um, and for a long time, I also had that stereotype in my head of, you know, poetry is this very um, pretentious, you know, aristocratic sort of art form and I wouldn't fit in. Um, and then, like I said, I, I went to that workshop and I found very quickly that poetry was in a lot of ways this, this vibrant beating heart and a form of um, rebellion and self-expression for a lot of people. And it was a wonderful way to express anger and, and emotions that weren't very um, aristocratic or formal at, at all. Um, and so for me, that's when I fell in love with poetry, when I let go of that prejudice and the idea that it was this, you know, this snobby thing and just kind of let myself sit with the emotions. Um, so I guess if you have someone in your life who you want to get into poetry, but they're not really there yet, you know, show them how emotional and how powerful it can be rather than allowing them to have that misconception of, oh, it's just this really pretentious um, high society thing full of stuck up people who are impossible to work with, as Wendy previously <laughs> mentioned. Um, yeah, get them away from that headspace and then show them some really hard hitting work. It looks like we're going to have to... Um wind up and we only have a couple minutes left so if anybody does anybody have like any last quick uh thoughts or anything you'd like to say about yourself or your current work if anybody has anything speak up oh, of course um I, i'm wendy van camp i i am a poet <laughs> I, I can admit <laughs> that now uh, my uh, latest book is called the planets a sci-fi coup poetry collection it is available on all online retailers from amazon to whatever um it is no uh, nominated for an elgin award if you are an sfpa member i i'm soliciting your vote <laughs> we'll say that um but um yeah it, it's available it, it's my only um poetry work that's uh, in a book form. It's my first book. Um, but you can also find my poetry on uh, Medium online. Um, just go ahead and look up my name and it'll come onto my profile and there'll be links to my poetry that you can read either for free or if you're a member of, um, of Medium, it'll, it's, some of the publications are for members only, but it is available there. Or you can go to my website, No Wasted Ink, Dot com, and a lot of my sci-fi coup illustrations are available there for free. So you can see my little poems and my um, art drawings as well. And of course, a lot of prose and a lot of uh, things about uh, science fiction books, book reviews, mm -hmm. author interviews, things of that nature. Yeah, it looks like we're very close to... Well, let's get the others yeah. in there then. So this is, this is one of my artworks. It's actually part of my business card. But if you go to gardnercastle.com, you'll find a lot of links to either online works or places where you can get my work. This is a, um, the Poetry Society of Virginia's last year's anthology. I've got Black Cat Halloween in this book. But I also wanted to just quickly um, applaud Quinn for that answer that you gave and, and to, to add that um, poetry is everywhere. I mean, it's in the beauty of, of listening to a cat's meow. And it's in it's in so many of the songs. I mean, when I was in uh, when I was a graduate student in poetry, I did a project on Bob Dylan. And at first, my teacher was skeptical because she's like, he's just a popular singer. But I proved how poetic he was. So I would say, you know, just remind people that there's so many different ways of experiencing poetry, and it's not just always in the formal verse, which I do love. Emily Dickinson's still one of my favorites. That's all. <laughs> oh, it's nice. Okay. Um... Let's see. 
Liz, would uh, you please. like to say anything? Yeah. Well, tacking onto what she just said, the first poetry, of course, was lyrical poetry, which is not to say that every songwriter is a poet, but uh, you can sure name more than Dylan. Leonard Cohen would come to mind. And if you're looking for an accessible poet, uh, the American Billy uh -huh. Collins, I think, is very accessible. Uh -huh. And if you have a wee bit of Irish in you, Seamus uh -huh. Haney can't be beat. Great suggestion. Where can I find um, Liz and Quinn? Where can I find y'all's work? My work is, I actually don't have a, a solid online platform yet. I'm trying to work. Okay, screen share. Yes, share. Mm. Where are the phones? There I go. Great. I need. Thank you all for attending the virtual Balticon 54, the poetry contest winners reading hosted by Patty Kinlock. Uh, please bear in mind if you wish to continue with discussions uh, for further panels or to join us, please go over to Discord. The URL is on the, uh, on the shared page. If you have found any enjoyment, we do ask that you consider uh, donating to BISFIS, which will enable us to continue running both the Baltimore Science Fiction Society and to continue for next year's Balticon 55. Thank you for joining us and hope that you continue to have a good Balticon 54. <laughs>